today's topic, uh, many of you are very familiar with this. I've often spoken about uh, uh, life and death and resurrection. But it's never, uh, you know, I never get tired of uh, speaking about this because it's such an exciting uh, joy to know that, uh, exceeding joy to know that uh, we are, have been given salvation and we will never die. We will never die. And I'm going to talk to you about how we can never die and uh, define what death is and then how from the time we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, we have life, eternal life. This life starts here, right here, and goes on for eternity. I'm going to see how God made his amazing grace uh, become available for us. Now, in the book of Romans, in chapter 5, verse 17, Paul writes, If by the trespass of one man, death reign to that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Christ Jesus. Because of Adam's sin, in the world today, death is reigning. Death is reigning. There are some religions in the world, and uh, they all religions are designed to try to find God, find truth. But in Christ, uh, we, we have a relationship with God, not a religion. He came to give us new life, eternal life. It's not a change of religion for people. It's not conversion from one religion to another religion. In fact, when uh, Peter, the apostle, was rescued from prison by an angel in Acts chapter 5, verse 1920, they read how the angel tells uh, Peter, go stand the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. Go tell these people the full message of this new life. It's not a new religion. It's a new life. And they are supposed to be, uh, they are supposed to go and tell the people the full message of this new life which God has given to mankind. And uh, life basically means, you know, growth. And we are talking about growth in the Lord. First of all, having a relationship with Him and growing with Him. In, in him. Death is separation. And no religion in the world has given a solution for death. They all talk about, uh, you know, uh, different things, born again and again and again and again. And uh, different things are given, uh, philosophies and teachings. But Christ came to give us new life, eternal life and abundant life. In the world today, death or separation is reigning. Two kinds of death, physical death and spiritual death. Physical separation is separation of the spirit from the body. As long as the spirit lives in the body, there is life. When the spirit leaves the body, it is death. In the book of uh, uh, Genesis, chapter 2 or 7, we read about how uh, when God made man, he took the dust of the earth and breathed the nostril, the breath of life, and man became a living being. This breath of life actually is the spirit of God, a spirit of man, given, to, given by God to man, spirit of man. Isaiah 57 verse 16. So spirit in the body is life, physical life. As compared to that, physical death is spirit leaving the body. James 2.26. As the body without the spirit is dead, faith without deeds is dead. And between the time the spirit entered the body and left the body, the spirit got contaminated because of sin. And that's why we die. Romans 5 12 says, Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all people because all people sinned. Now, we're going to focus tonight on spiritual separation. How Christ came to save us from spiritual separation, to unite us with God, that's life, new life, eternal life, that begins right here. In fact, God gave us victory over death, spoken of by the prophets much, much before Jesus entered the world. In Psalm 68, verse 20, we read, Psalm 68, verse 20, 
Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Today, as God's people, we don't fear death because he has given us escape from death by giving us eternal life. Much before Christ entered the world, around 720 BC, there were two prophets who spoke about victory over death. One was Isaiah, other was Hosea. Both at the same time, around 720 BC. Isaiah was prophesying in Jerusalem and Hosea was prophesying in the northern kingdom of Israel. And both spoke about death being destroyed. Isaiah, writing about Mount Zion, look at the book of Isaiah chapter 24, verse 23, talks about Mount Zion, representing Jerusalem, representing uh, the, the city of David area in Jerusalem. And he spoke, he prophesied about that particular mountain, Mount Zion. Chapter 25 of Isaiah, verse 7 and 8. He says, on this mountain, he will destroy the show that enfolds all nations, the sheet that covers all peoples. He will swallow up death forever. The destruction of death, the death of death was actually prophesied by Isaiah on this mountain. On this mountain, he will destroy the show that enfolds all nations, the sheet that covers all peoples. He will swallow up death forever. That mountain was Mount Zion. It's very interesting to see that when Abraham was called by God to offer son Isaac as a sacrifice, actually he was in uh, Beersheba, southern part of Israel those days. He was living in Beersheba. And the Lord told him to go north to the region of Moriah and offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And God told him, on one of the mountains I will show you. You go to Egypt and Moriah, sacrifice your son Isaac on one of those mountains, which I will show you. So all the way from Beersheba, he goes to the region of Moriah. What's so special about Moriah? Moriah was the place where later on the city of David was built. Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, it was Jebus. There was no Jerusalem. It was called Jebus, occupied by the Jebusites. Jebusites. And Abraham was told by God, take your son, the one son he will love, and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will show you. So he goes to the region of Moriah, and God showed him a mountain where he was supposed to sacrifice son Isaac. And we all know the story. God provided a substitute for him, for Isaac. And then after God saw Abraham was believed to offer son Isaac a sacrifice, the Lord tells him, look up and try to count the stars. Because you did not hesitate to offer your one son whom you love, I am going to give you children like the stars in the universe. Like the stars in the universe. And then, much later, when this book was written actually by Moses, the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis chapter 22 verse 14, it's written there, even to this day, it is said, on this mountain it shall be provided. What is that mountain? That mountain was Mount Zion. Zion is very close to Moriah. God took Abraham from Beersheba to the region of Moriah, showed him a mountain. And then much later, Moses writes, even to this day it is mentioned, it is said, on this mountain it shall be provided. What shall be provided? Children for Abraham, like the stars in the universe. And we are those children. We are children of Abraham. If you belong to Christ, we are Abraham's seed. And has got the promise. Galatians 3, 29. So God showed him a mountain. That mountain was Zion. And it says in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 32, in Jerusalem, 
and on Mount Zion, there will be deliverance because the, the cross of Christ will actually be planted in that region. On Zion. On Zion. So God took Abraham all the way from Beersheba to Shoma Mountain. And that's why Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. What did Abraham see? God showed him a mountain. On this mountain should be provided. And that was the cross. You know, it's amazing to know, even uh, Obadiah prophesied about how deliverance will be on top of that mountain of, 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 of Zion. In Mount Zion will be deliverance, that is, uh, 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 sorry, Obadiah 17, 18. On Mount Zion there will be deliverance, it will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess an inheritance. So, that is the cross of Christ. And Isaac prophesied about how on this mountain, he will destroy the shoulder and fold all nations, the sheet that covers all peoples. What is that? Death. He will swallow up death forever. Then you find Hosea. At the same time, around 720 BC, he was prophesying in northern kingdom of Israel, along with Amos. Uh, so God's prophet through Hosea that uh, he will redeem them from the power of the grave. I redeem them from the grave. I, I will ransom from, from the grave. I redeem them from death. That is a prophecy. And that is fulfilled ultimately on the cross. Now, sometimes they refer to uh, Calvary and Golgotha. They are basically the same. Calvary is Latin, Golgotha is, is Arabic or Greek. Both means the place of the skull where Christ was actually crucified. Now, every prophet prophesied about. Forgiveness of sins through Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 2, 14, 15, very specifically God spoke about freedom from the fear of death, which is actually our topic for, for tonight. In Hebrews 2, 14, 15, it's written, Since the children have flesh and blood, God's children, He participated in their humanity. So that by His death, he will destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery, slavery by their fear of death. Every fear, unhealthy fear, makes us a slave to that particular fear. Especially the fear of death. Because the one who has the power of death was the devil. But Jesus destroyed the devil on the cross. This body of flesh and blood was prepared in the womb of the Virgin Mary for the Christ to come and live. Very often people ask this question. Since God is sovereign, he can do anything. He's answerable to nobody. Why can't God take us all to heaven just like that? Why should Christ come down? Why should he die on the cross? Why all that pain? Why blood shed on the cross? It's a fact is that God's justice has to be executed. God's justice demands that sin must be paid for, for death to be destroyed. God is the God of justice, is the God of love. God's justice demands the sin must be paid for. There should be a ransom for sin. Ransom should be paid to fulfill God's standards of righteousness. Now the Bible talks about Christ being a ransom for our sins. A ransom is normally paid by the, in take for example in the case of a kidnapping, the kidnapper pays the ransom to the, owner, to the father of the uh, child who is kidnapped. The child is kidnapped, the father of the child gets a notice or a demand from the kidnapper, pay so much of money as ransom, otherwise he won't give back your son. So normal ransom is paid by the one whose son was kidnapped to the kidnapper. Right? That's how ransom is paid. The recipient of the ransom 
is a kidnapper. Now, if Christ was the ransom for our sins, as it says in the in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, is a ransom for our sins. To whom was the ransom paid? To whom was the ransom paid? To the devil? No way. Who is the devil to demand ransom? Now, if you look at Psalm 49, 7 to 9, we find the answer. Psalm 49, 7 to 9. It says there, no man can redeem the life of another man or give to God a ransom for life. A ransom for life is too costly. No payment is ever enough that a man can go on forever and not see decay. Ransom was paid to God because God's justice, righteousness demands payment for sins. And Jesus came to satisfy justice of God by offering his body on the cross as a sacrifice for sins. Sin has to be paid for. It has to be a perfect sacrifice. As early as in the book of Leviticus, 17 chapter verse 11, we read, blood has been given as atonement for sin. The life of the creature is in the blood. And God says, I have given it as atonement for sin. So blood is very precious to God. It symbolizes victory over death, victory over sin, payment for sin. And some of most philosophies and most religions of the old, ancient belief system, there has been a belief that blood sacrifice has to be made for the sin of man. There has been a belief, not only in, in Israel, in the Old Testament prescription for sacrifice, also other, other old uh, civilizations, Indian civilization, African civilization, they been belief in sacrifice. And they offered animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice can never take away sin. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 says, it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away sin. Some people thought human beings are a higher form of life than animals. Let's offer human sacrifice. And uh, Psalm 49, Psalm says, no man can redeem life for another man or give to God a ransom for life. A ransom for life is too costly. No payment is ever enough. The man can go on forever and not see decay. So animal sacrifice cannot take away sin. Human sacrifice cannot take away sin. Yet the Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no sacrifice for sins. And in Isaiah 59, verse 16 is written, God saw there was no one, no one to intervene, so his own arm worked out salvation. So when Christ entered the world in flesh and blood, a flesh and blood body was prepared in the womb of the Virgin Mary for the Christ to come and live, and once he prayed to the Father and said, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, he told the Father, sacrifices and burnt offerings you didn't desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Here I am. I have come to do your will. A body of flesh and blood was prepared in the womb of the Virgin Mary for the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Word of God, who is Spirit, to come and dwell and live in. And the purpose of this body of flesh and blood was it has to be crucified on the cross after the Messiah lives a sinless life. So his coming to the world was because the children have flesh and blood. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death, by his death, the crucifixion. He will destroy the one who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So now when you come to believe in this amazing work of Christ on the cross, we don't fear death because we have been given life. By that perfect blood of Christ, from a, coming from a perfect life, 
That blood has cleansed us of every sin in the spirit. It's because of sin in our spirit that we can't go to heaven when we die. Death is reigning in the world because not only physical death, even spiritual death is reigning. Because in the hearts of man, there is sin. When the spirit comes out, being an unclean spirit, it cannot enter into God's presence. He is absolutely holy. 1 John 1 5 says, God is light. In him there is no darkness. And with one sin in our spirits, we can't enter into God's presence. We are cut off from God. Sometimes people ask me this question. You say God is a God of love. If God is a God of love, how come this God sends people to hell? First of all, let's understand, hell was not made for man. Matthew 25, 41 says, hell was made for Satan and his angels, not for man. Never meant for man actually. But because of sin of man, he came under control of the evil one, showed his back to God, went away from God, came under devil's control, and therefore, with sin in the heart, cannot go to heaven. So what prevents him from going to heaven is not God, but sin. In Isaiah 59, verse 12, it says, Isaiah 59, 12, our sins testify against us. When a human being leaves this world, with one sin in the spirit, that sin will testify against him. You can't go to heaven. It's too holy for you. You can't find yourself comfortable in heaven. And Christ came for that very purpose to remove that sin by his perfect sacrifice on the cross. On the cross, after six hours, when he said, it is finished, what is finished was God's plan of salvation just prepared, plan is prepared before man was created. From the foundations of the world, 1 Peter 1.20, he was chosen the Lamb of God from the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 says, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10, this grace was given us before the beginning of time, but now been revealed to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This plan was prepared a long time ago. Christ existed from the very beginning. He shared the glory of creation with the Father much before the world was created. And remember his word of God then? He was son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Messiah means he, in Hebrew, Christ in, in Greek means uh, the anointed one. Only when he entered the world, he was given the name Jesus or Yeshua, the one who saves. So on the cross, when he said it is finished, the plan worked out by the Godhead long time ago, before the creation of the world, was completed on the cross. He was put in a tomb. The third day he rose from the dead because it was impossible for death to hold him. Death could not hold him. Went back to God the Father, prophesied in the Bible about how he resurrected. In the 16th chapter of Acts, verse 10 talks about how he resurrected. That's the only verse that talks about a Messiah being resurrected, coming back to life. Now, you know, among the Pharisees and Sadducees and Jews, Pharisees don't believe in the resurrection. Pharisees do. Why? Because Sadducees only believe the first five books of the Old Testament. They believe only the first five books. About Christ's resurrection, his body will not see decay. Is specified in book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 10, which is quoted by Peter after he, when he spoke to all the people about Christ's resurrection. In Acts, chapter 2, verse 24, he talks about how it was impossible for death to hold him. And he's quoting verse 27, he's quoting Psalm 16, verse 10, where he's prophesied about how his body will not see decay. Since the Sadducees do not believe in the apart from the first five books of the Old Testament, they don't believe the resurrection because it's not prophesied for them. Pharisees believe in the resurrection. 
Well, unfortunately, today they don't believe that Jesus is that savior. That's their problem. But for us who have come to believe the amazing good news of salvation, at the point of time we accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, His Spirit entered our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. From that point of time, we can enjoy this eternal life. Eternal life means eternal relationship with God the Father through Jesus. It starts at the point of time we accept Christ as Savior and Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it's written, He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. And this oneness starts at the point of time we accept Christ as Savior and Lord. Oneness means peace, or the peace means oneness. And Colossians chapter 1, 19, 20 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, the things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through blood shed on the cross. So, we have peace with God, oneness with God, our spirit and God's spirit have oneness, this continues for how long? For eternity. While living in this world, we can choose to have constant fellowship with the Father. And one day when we leave the world, when the Spirit comes out of the body, the Spirit goes straight to Jesus. And the fellowship continues for eternity. Continues. That's why we never die. We fall asleep. Believers in Christ don't die. They fall asleep in Christ. This new life starts at the point of time we accept Christ as Savior and Lord and goes on in life, physical life in this world. When the physical life comes to an end, body goes to dust, spirit goes to Jesus. And we continue living with him in heaven. When he comes a second time, we will come with him. If we look at 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, from verse 13, we read, Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, verse 13, We don't want to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. The rest of the people in this world have no hope. Death is raining for them. They have no hope of life beyond this physical life on this earth. Don't be ignorant about those who fall asleep meaning those who sleep in Christ, or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died. We believe that Jesus died. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who fall asleep in him. God will bring with Jesus those who fall asleep in him. So what will happen to us? At the time of leaving this world, it goes to Jesus immediately. We'll have fellowship with him in heaven. When he comes back a second time, our spirits will come with him. And the bodies in the dust will be raised to life. Raised to life. A spiritual body. When he comes second time, we'll all come back to life. Physical body. Till that point of time, body in the dust or ashes or in the water, wherever we die, spirit goes to Jesus. Continues having fellowship with him there. And when he comes second time, Christ will come with him. Body raised to life. We'll have a new body and it'll be like the body of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44, we read, Paul writes, The body that is sown is perishable, raised imperishable. This physical body perishes. The five elements in the human body it's the same with the five elements in the dust. When you leave the body, bury the body in water or dust or ashes, it goes to the ground. Decays. It's perishable. What's sown is perishable, raised imperishable. Imperishable. That's why we live on forever in the new body. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. 
sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Till the time, where are spirits? With Jesus. So in this world, reconciled to him. Sometimes we have fellowship with him, sometimes we don't have fellowship with him. We go our own way. After we leave this world, go to heaven, we can't run anywhere. We always have fellowship with him. So I believe when I go to heaven one day, God will tell me, my dear Raj, you can't run away anywhere. But I have a new name. We have a new name, you know, in heaven. Like, he'll give us a new name. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation. What the name is, I don't know. But right now he calls me Raj. Three times he spoke to me. Morning woke me up from bed. Three times in the how many years now? 40 years. Three times I heard his voice. Raj, get up. Second time, Raj, get up. Third time, Raj. Now I have a name called Raj. Later on, I have a different name. We'll all have different names. But then we'll have fellowship with him. When he comes second time, we'll come with him. Join with the body, a new body, a spiritual body, which will be like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. For sown is perishable, raised imperishable. Now in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, from verse 54 onwards we read, when the perishable has told them the imperishable and the mode of the immortality, then the same will come true. Then the same will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Spoken now by whom? By the prophets of old. Isaiah 25 verse 8, verse 7, and Hosea 13 chapter verse 14. These both have mentioned that passage. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where of death is your sting? Where of death is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in victory. So that will happen when they resurrected the fulfillment of that prophecy. Right now, we have fellowship with God. We never die. Death means separation. Even though sometimes we lack in faith, we may be faithless, he remains faithful. That's why such an amazing inheritance we have got, this, this hope of salvation. You know, when you think of that and you for our mind is on the fact that we resurrected, it gives us exceeding joy. And if you look at first, we we're doing a study of First Peter in the mornings, Bible studies, and we read about how in First Peter chapter one, uh, Peter writes to the church in, in the region of Pontus, Galatia, Capricia, Asia, and Bithynia, how uh, in this we rejoice, verse seven, First Peter one seven. In this we rejoice. What, what do we rejoice in? He's given us new birth into a living hope. To the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fate kept in heaven, heaven for us. We rejoice in that. In this, we rejoice. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6, 6 and 7. Now, this word rejoicing here is a very interesting word. It's a word called uh, in Greek, uh, it's a word which actually means exult. Exult. Agalaio. Aga, A-G-A-L-L-I-A-O, Agalayo. Agalayo means exulting, jumping for joy, exceeding joy, not ordinary joy. Now, as compared to this particular word, Agalayo, you uniquely use in this particular verse, in this you rejoice, in this means what? Hope of the resurrection. No more death. We are, we are going to go to heaven. In this we exult. We jump for joy, exceeding joy. As compared to that, the word used in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always, that word is not agalayo. It's a word called Cairo. C-H-A-I-R-O, Cairo, or Chairo. Chara means joy. Chairo is rejoicing. Rejoice for so many things. But you think of resurrection and inheritance of God, we exult, we jump for joy. That's why you find in the same letter of Peter, you go down to verse 8 and 9. Peter writes to the Christians in this area. He says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. If they don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Indescribable joy. Agalayo, 
jumping for joy, exulting. So when we remember this amazing work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection, you know, even though we die, we will live. Die in terms of human perspective of death, spirit leaving the body. When the body goes to dust or ashes, buried, oh, he's gone, he's dead. He's not dead. He's gone to heaven. He's enjoying. It's only chemicals. The body after death is only chemicals. No point putting flowers and putting and you know, all the things on top of the decorating it. No, no point. It's as good as decorating stone. Because it is no life in it. We are going to heaven. Enjoying heaven. Psalm 116 verse 15. Precious inside of God are the death of the saints. Our death is precious to God. What comes to death is precious to God. Because for us it is a homecoming. For God we are going home. When you understand this, we realize you won't fear death. You won't fear death. He destroyed the fear of death on the cross. That's why he took a body of flesh and blood. Because the demands of God's justice or payment for sin had to be made. He is a God of justice. Sin must be paid for. We can't pay for our sins. So Christ paid for our sins. He took away punishment and gave us peace. Just thinking about that itself, enough joy for us. No? He has given us peace. We deserve punishment. No? He has given us peace. On the cross, both grace and mercy were manifested. What is mercy? Mercy is we not getting what we deserve. What is grace? We getting what we don't deserve. Let me repeat that. Mercy is you and me not getting what we deserve. Because of sin, we deserve punishment. We don't get punishment. That's mercy. And what is grace? We receiving the blessings of God, the goodness of God, which we don't deserve. On the cross, you find both beautifully executed. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, Isaiah 53, 5, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So it's a punishment. He gave us peace. Not getting punishment, you and me, is the mercy of God. Getting peace is the grace of God. So we have grace and mercy. Just think of that. So therefore, in this world, in a wicked world, we can reign in life. This is what Paul writes to the church in, uh, in, in Rome. If by the trespass of one man, death reign to that one man, how much more then will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Christ Jesus. We will reign here, we will reign in heaven. For heaven, we have a righteousness given to us, so we go to heaven because of his righteousness, Christ. And for reigning in this world over all the problems, he gives us abundant grace, wisdom, strength, power, faith, everything he gives to us. So we are actually overcomers. She keep on thanking God for the amazing blessings he showed upon us. I find amazing with all these blessings, how many Christians grumble. Why me, Lord? Why this problem, Lord? We don't realize that in the will of God, when you walk in the will of God, every problem we face is a blessing. It's a blessing. When the Bible says count your blessings, I think it also includes count your suffering. Because suffering is a blessing for us. James 1.12 says, James 1.12, Blessed is the man, blessed is the man, who perceives under trial. When he stood the test, he was the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So, coming back to fear of death, we don't fear at all death because we don't never die. Our spirits never die. We live on. We are, when we fall asleep in Christ. But many people fear physical death. Not what happen, happens after death. Christians actually fear physical death. How will I die? Will I die with pain? Will I die lying in a bed, paralytic for many years, being a burden upon my relatives? And they're going to worry about how they're going to die. But when you believe in, in the resurrection of Christ, we want fear what happened after death because 
They're going to live with him in, in heaven forever and ever. In John 11, 25, 26, Jesus says, He who believes in me will live even though he dies. He who lives and believes in me will never die. So don't fear what happens after death. Now the question is, many fear the event of death. Like my wife Ragini, I told you very often I shared this, before she, about a year before she passed away, or even in the court period, I was talking about uh, life and how wonderful to serve God. And she said, that, see, I want to go to heaven before you. I can't bear to see you go. Uh, then, then she said, please pray that I go before you. And then I said, why are you, are you fearing death? He said, I don't fear death. I fear, I don't fear what happens after death. I fear the way I might die. So pray one more prayer. Please pray I die in my sleep. So I, did, I prayed uh, without any conviction <laughs> that uh, she should go before me because that I, I didn't know what would happen. But I, because she wanted me to pray, I prayed like that. Then in regard to uh, sleeping, uh, dying in sleep, I prayed for that. So she wants to die in her sleep, but to die in sleep. And both happened. She went before me and she died in her sleep. Now my point is this. <clears throat> I don't want to tell God how I should die. Personally for me. Because I trust in a God. And we should trust in a God also. Who wants the best for us. The best for us. And the best for us is in heaven. He'll give us rewards in heaven. And sometimes. How we suffer for the Lord in this world. Not sometimes, always. The sufferings in the Lord. Great for eternal glory in heaven. He wants to give us the best. He always does what is best. So whatever manner he wants you and me to leave this world, leave it to him. I have no preference how I'm going to die. I have told God I'm willing to die for you, Lord. I'm willing to die. That's a long time back I told God. As an evangelist, you remember what will happen. I say, I'm willing to die for you, but I can't retire. Decide. I want to tell you how I should die. I don't fear the event of death also. Because our God is a God is absolutely the personification of love. And he'll, even the manner of death we're going to have, or leaving this world we're going to have, he knows what is best. He will do what is best for us. Ravani had a very simple childlike faith, and God honored the childlike faith that she wants to die in her sleep. I'll give her a death in her sleep. That's God's amazing grace upon her. But I would recommend, I, personally for me, I have not asked God how I should die. Because I know his choice of manner of death for me is the best the best. So leave it to him. I only suggest to you, don't even think, think of dying. Don't think of going to heaven. There's so much of work to be done here. We all have purpose in life. Acts 13.36 says, Acts 13.36 When David had served God's purpose for his generation, he fell asleep. His body decayed and was gathered to his forefathers. He fulfilled God's purpose for his generation. God has a purpose for our generation today, wherever we live. So please be busy fulfilling that. Left to myself, I want to live long to serve God, to fulfill his purpose. I love to serve God. I, I mean, love to go home and be with him. It's the best place to be. But then God's will is I must live here. And I barely believe I'm going to live long here. To serve people, to glorify God. And don't think about what happens after death because that's an amazing thing for us. It's, we, we rejoice in that, we exult in that. Don't think about where I'm going to go. You are surely going to heaven if Christ is in you. Christ is in you, surely going to heaven. We exult in that joy. Exult. Not just as the word is agalayo, I told you. Whereas as compared to Cairo, which is the joy, having a lot of joy, no doubt, but not exceeding joy, not jumping for joy. Not exceeding joy. Exaltation is something beyond normal joy. And that happens when you remember the assurance of salvation. In this world, we live for him. As Paul writes in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So live for him. It's, it's, it's Christ. Living is Christ. Dying is gain. Romans 14.8, if you live, we live for the Lord. We live to the Lord. We die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So for us as believers in Christ, there is no fear of death. 
2,000 years back when he entered the world, he took away the fear of death, with which people have been slaves. Slavery to fear of death. He destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and set us totally free, free to serve him, free to fulfill his will, and rise above every difficulty in this world. We reign in life through Christ. For other people, rest of the world, death is reigning. For us, we reign in life. For them, death reigns over them, poor things. But when we share the gospel, they come to our fold, Lord's fold, on our fold, where we are. And we reign in life. Not death reigning over them, over us. We reigning in life. The assurance that death has no meaning for us. In fact, death has died. You know, once you go to heaven, you know something? There's no more death. No more death. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. There's no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. Now, some people have this question. You know, many years back, there was a rebel in heaven. Satan rebelled against God. Sin was there in heaven that time, and he was banned from heaven. When you go to heaven now, Supposing we again sin, what happened again? Something happens there. But good news is, no impure thing will ever enter that place. Revelation 21st chapter is 27. Nothing impure will ever enter that place. So your, all your doubts are cleared now. We be with him in heaven forever and ever in him. And you can be with him from here onwards. It starts here, eternal life. Goes on. In this body, till we leave this world. After that, it goes to, we go to heaven. He made it with Jesus. Continue there. He'll come back. We'll also come back with him. We'll be with him always, forever. So no death. Death has been destroyed. Death has died for us. He destroyed death on the cross. What an amazing joy it is to know that. Keep on thanking and praising God. You know, when, when you know all these things, when you believe these things, no? There's no chance of complaining to God. No question of grumbling, complaining, questioning God. He said, I've given such an amazing gift. Amazing gift of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 9, 15, 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 15, Paul says, this, this is an indescribable gift. Indescribable gift, salvation. If forget about salvation, get caught up with all the things of the world and ask God why this happened, why that happened. Please don't do that. We rejoice in Him and don't grumble Argue your question. Philippians chapter 2, 14 to 16. Philippians 2nd chapter 14 to 16. Do everything without complaining or arguing. You may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. As you shine like stars in the universe. As you hold out the word of life. May God bless us as we constantly remember this indescribable joy of salvation. They will exult in this salvation, not just rejoice normally as Cairo, exultation, agalayo in Greek, remembering that God has great things to offer for us in heaven. In this world, we live for him. Let's pray and we we'll pray that God give us the wisdom and the strength to live for him in this world and keep on thanking him for the amazing blessings, especially special blessings he's showering upon us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for everyone on the Zoom, Lord. Help us never forget this indescribable gift you've given us, Lord, of salvation. Help us exult in this salvation, Lord. And Lord, be a people who rise above every situation, Lord. We reign in life, Lord, and never forget you destroyed death on the cross. One day, Lord, this perishable will close the imperishable, mortality, the immortality, and we'll know, Lord, that. We're going to be with you in heaven forever and ever. There's no mourning, crying, sorrow, pain. Only eternal joy of having fellowship with you, Lord. Help us fulfill your purpose for us in this world. Give us your wisdom, give us your strength, give us your anointing, Lord, to live for you every day of our lives, Lord. In Jesus' precious and matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.